introduce you to, um, to a, a local pastor who's got a lovely story to tell. Um, and uh, when we first started uh, the Wessex Filling Station, um, Andy said to me, we've got to have testimonies. Testimonies are so powerful. And um, it, that's proved to be so. So I'd like to, uh, to welcome Liam. Uh, Liam Husband, he's the pastor at Centerpoint Elim Church in Winton. And uh, it's like, welcome. Thank you. And uh, tell us your story. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you, uh, Brian, for inviting me to come and share. Um, I stand as a trophy of God's grace. Um, that's the only thing that I can describe myself, actually, and it's not really fair because Brian's only given me eight minutes um, to share. So the way that I'm working this out, I'm going to share the first 26 years of my life in four minutes, and I'm going to share the next 12 years of my life in four minutes too. So you've worked it out, I'm 38. Have you worked that one out? Some of you are quick maths. So... Uh, my first 26 years in numbers goes something like this. Forgive me, this poor lady here is trying to keep up with the rate of knots that I speak. And she's doing a great job. You are doing a great job. Thank you. Um, but, so I grew up in a place called Asken in Yorkshire. Anybody know where Asken is? Anybody know where Yorkshire is, right? Yeah, Yorkshire Massive, good. So I grew up in a little pit village called Asken that was a pit village. The whole reason Asken was there was because of the pit. I walked by the pit every day on my way to school and got covered in coal, and I loved it. And um, I grew up there. My dad worked offshore on the oil rigs, and I saw him one week of every month. So work that one out. I saw him 12 times a year. My dad was absent. When he got back, the only place that I could find him was in the local club. He was always in the local working man's club getting drunk. He was a drinker. My mum was a drinker too. I lived at home with just me and my brother. At the age of seven, my mum grabbed her shopping bag, which was, it wasn't unusual, and she said, I'm going to the shops. She never came back. My dad came back from work that day and said, where's your mum? He's like, I'm seven, you tell me. And uh, we, were, we, were lot, uh, we were puzzled, really. Two weeks later, my mum was found unconscious outside Sheffield train station. She tried to commit suicide on vodka and paracetamol. I didn't know what was going on at the time, but actually living with my dad wasn't that nice. My dad was physically abusive. My mum never came back to the house. I lived with my dad on my own and my brother. My dad had had an affair with the pub landlady, very convenient for him, because that's where he always spent his time. And so we, we just kind of was brought into this new family, and it was very strange. I got, had sisters that I never wanted. I had a stepmom that I never wanted. It was really, really strange, and life was just thrown at me, and I didn't feel like I ever caught up. My dad was a drinker. He was an angry man. He was an aggressive man. If, if we did anything out of Lord order, he would beat us up. That was the way that he did it. That's the way he disciplined me and my brother. We moved to another part of Doncaster. I'm not doing well here. Sorry, Brian. We mo moved to another part of Doncaster called Intake, which is near Doncaster Racecourse. Um, my brother was put in care uh, when he, he was, he would be 11. Uh, and I just didn't want to be in house. We, we hated live, being at home. My brother was, he, he had a real thing against my stepmom. Every time my dad came back from work, he wasn't working on the oil rigs back then. When he got back from work, I'm speaking very fast because you've only given me eight minutes. Um, <laughs> and um, my, my, my dad would get back from work and my stepmom would tell him everything that we'd done during the day and everything we hadn't done during the day and everything we called her during the day. And so my dad would just unleash fury of us on us and, and, and really just beat us. And so, yeah, my brother was put in care um, after an incident in the, in the front garden where my dad broke my brother's nose. And I was jealous of my brother going into care. I didn't want to be at home. I was 10 years old. I found myself being outside of the house as much and as long as possible to the early hours of the night. I found myself knocking around a park near the hospital and I was 10 years old and the people that I was knocking around with were 16, 17, 18 years old. And I, I looked up to them. They were my role models. I wanted to do everything that they did because they accepted me. And the, these were people that gave me affirmation and everything that I wanted as a 10-year-old boy. I was this high. I had a squeaky voice. I was, it was unbelievable. And um, 
I looked up to these guys and they were smoking, they were drinking, they were inhaling gas. You could go into the local shop and buy a 50p can of gas and you could inhale it and 25 minutes later you could go and buy another can of 50p gas. Such that was the day. And uh, so that's what we did. And um, yeah, I found myself in a bubble, in a, in a self-contained bubble bubble and I, I loved it because nothing could penetrate that bubble. My dad couldn't penetrate that bu- bubble with his beatings and that's the way that I just grew up and adapted to life. And so from the age of 10 up until I was 26, my drug appetite grew. I did three prison sentences, uh, two committed to, I tried to commit suicide twice, I've had three overdoses, one car accident, um, a few bricks around my head, um, yeah, a few accidents and, and here I am. When I was 26, I'd been on heroin and crack cocaine for nine years. And I'd tried to get clean a few different ways. I'd been to NA, I'd been to different places. And I, w- I did a year at college as a, as a doing horticulture. And uh, I wanted to do a chainsaw course, but they wouldn't let me. And, and uh, it's one of those things. And so I did horticulture, which was the next best thing. When I finished horticulture, it was, it was part of probation, I got a job as a greenkeeper and they let me loose in a six-wheeler John Deere buggy diesel. It was amazing. Five o'clock in the morning, just me on a golf course with my earphones in. I loved it. I was having the time of my life. And I was also earning money that I'd never really appreciated before. And um, I, I was earning £1,400 a month. And before I knew it, I was spending £1,400 a month before the end of the month on crack again. And by the end of the month when I was getting paid, I was just handing it over. And I just, yeah, when you, when you, when you do crack, you do heroin at the same time. It all goes part hand in hand. And so my money went and I was just ended up in a bit of a mess again. I couldn't keep my job down. I got the sack for crashing the six-wheeler John Deere buggy. And here I was just thinking, I've tried and I've failed. This is my life. And I went to see a friend, and uh, you know, I had one of those Rodney, Rodney and Del Boy moments. He convinced me to start selling heroin for him, and I told myself, this time next year, I'm going to be a millionaire. And I left his house, and I went to my house. In a 20-minute walk, I convinced myself to commit suicide and inject all the heroin that I could. And so that's what I did. I went home, I prepared it, I shot it in my arm in two hits, and I, yeah, I was ready to die. Absolutely. I woke up. Boom, I'm here. Of course I did, I'm here. And um, I, I, was, I was asking myself, why? Why? I had a sister who died when I was 16. She was 24. She died of, an, of one epileptic fit. I had a cousin who died from one punch. before He was dead before he hit the floor. I, had, I, I went to school, 13 boys in our class. Only four of us are still alive. And I was thinking about all this. Why am I still alive? There's other people around me that have died through one reason or the other. I've been electrocuted. I had car accidents. I've, been, I've, I've overdosed. I've been left for dead in the middle of the street. Why am I alive? And I made a decision that day to go and find out why. And the first thing that I needed to do was to go and get myself clean. And so I went to speak to my chemist and I got on the methadone program. And after about two weeks, the lady gave me a booklet for a treat Christian drug treatment center in the middle of a place called Chorley, which is in Shropshire. Put your hands up if you know Shropshire. And guess what? They did a chainsaw course. <laughs> yes. And so that's what, that's what pulled me to, uh, to Willardine Farm. A chainsaw course and a trip to South America. If you did nine months of your program, you went to South America to chop tree on trees. It's a dream. And so that's, I joked with my probation officer that you're never going to see me again. There was a little side note that actually it was a Christian drug treatment center, but I wasn't going for God because my relationship with God was non-existent. I was going for a chainsaw course. And so I went, I packed up my records, I packed up all my clothes and I turned up at Sh- in Shropshire I fell out with everybody within a week because that's what I did. I was angry and I didn't want people getting into my life. I kept people as far away from me as I could. So I picked fights with them. I just wanted them to stay away from me. So within a week or two, I'd fell out with everybody. I fell out with all the staff and thought, you know what? I don't think this is really for me. And I had a few conversations and I had one conversation with a guy called Roger who ended up being my best man. And there was something in him that inspired me. He'd been a heroin addict for 30 odd years and I, I just thought I want, to, I want to be like him. I looked up to him and, and so 
I started spending a bit of time with him and I noticed there was some things different in him that I'd never encountered before in my life. There was something in him that I'd been searching for for 26 years. I'd injected it, I'd snorted it, I'd slept around for it, I'd drank it, I'd gone for an adrenaline buzz. I'd done anything that I could to get this feeling that I saw in this man's face. And I said, what is it? And he said, it's Jesus. I said, well, how do I get this Jesus? And he said, well, you don't really get it. You just give your life to him. And I wasn't ready then that day. But I started going to church and I started worshipping. I'm not doing eight minutes, am I? Sorry. I'm I'm, I'm trying, Brian. I'm trying. The first time I realised that something had happened in my life, I walked by a wallet on a chair and it was full of £20 notes. And I walked by and I looked at it. I went to the toilet. I came back and I went and stood next to people who were singing. And I realised that I'd just walked by a wallet that was full of money and I hadn't picked it up and spent it. I realised then that something was happening in my life and I wanted more of it. And so I went to church and I went to prayer meetings and I went to every single place that I could where this Jesus fella was. (laughs) And I went to a a meeting by George Miller. Anybody know George Miller, the evangelist? I went to one of his meetings and he gave an altar call on the, the thief at the cross. And I responded because I'd seen enough. I'd done a few alphas and I knew that I was ready there and then to give my life to this fella called Jesus. And I was sat down in a place like this. I went on my knees and I gave my life to Jesus that day. And that was in 2006, in September 2006. I was baptised in April 2007 in Guyana, South America. When I was over there, I felt actually, I wanted to chop trees down for a living. That's why I got my chainsaw. But I felt God say, actually, I didn't give you a chainsaw just for the sake of it. I want you for more than that. I want you to go back into the mess that you've come out with and help people get out of that mess. And so when I came back from Guyana, I googled Bible school and mission training college and I ended up in a place in Gloucester called Redcliffe College. And it was the best three years of my life. God did more work in me as a person than he did academically wise. I left school with nothing. I was kicked out of school a month before everybody else finished. I got married. I've got four children. And and I I love Jesus with all of my life. And he's transformed me from the inside out. And he continues to transform me from the inside out. And here I am, sunny old Bournemouth. And I love it. I love it. And eight minutes isn't enough, Brian. uh, Thank you. (laughs) Wow. Oh, I don't know. I, I, I gave up looking at the clock. Ten minutes? But my, wow, you've, oh, no, you've no, worn no. it out. <laughs> let's just say, quick, let's, let's pray for you. Lord, I want to pray yeah. for Liam. Lord, I want to pray for his church. Lord, pour out your spirit continually on him. And Lord, allow him to be a mouthpiece to young and old alike, that they can see that you are his light. And I pray, Father God, that uh, many people would look at him and say, so what is it that you have? And Father, I just thank you for his story, for his testimony, which is so powerful. Amen. Bless you. I'm going to hand back to uh, Jotham and the team as uh, as they lead us in worship.